All right, so we're in the Arboretum today with Chris Early, who, Early, who's the Interpretive Biologist and Education Coordinator for the Arboretum, your Arboretum, and we're going to talk about, uh, we got a chance to ask Chris questions about the Arboretum, about the history of the Arboretum, the research projects that are going on in the Arboretum, the development pressures that the Arboretum, like all of the woodlots on campus, are under, and, and so I guess Chris, maybe, maybe let's start with a bit of where did you come from? Okay, <laughs> where did yeah. I come from? Where? Okay, uh, well, so I grew up in southern Ontario. Um, I was always one of those like nature geek kids, you know, they, they always find, you know, someone finds something in their yard, oh, we better call Chris Early, he's eight, he'll know what it is, and, um, and just never, just never grew out of that stage, and always knew that this was the, the type of thing that I wanted to do. So that's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. Cool. yeah, and then um, did, you know, lots of my own studies and stuff through high school, but then always knew I was going to come to the University of Guelph, came here, went through the zoology program, um, took nature interpretation with Alan Watson and thought, well, maybe instead of going into research, which I have done, I just recently did my master's um, of science uh, in environmental biology, um, but thought maybe I could be more effective in teaching, get get general public people interested in this type of thing too, so that you can maybe make more of, a, of an impact. You know? And the nature interpretation part is really what you do. That. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, I guess, what are the kinds of things that, as the with that long title, yeah. I guess, what are the kinds of things that you're that you get to do, or that you're exposed to, and helping people do in terms of, do you locate like if grad students or undergraduate students have projects they want to do in yeah. here? Yeah. So, um, uh, you guys are in first year, but as you get especially into third and fourth year, you're going to have all these different projects you need to do, and we have a 400 acre site that. You know, covers everything you want. Um, we've got forests, we have fields, we have swamps, we have um, a huge biodiversity of plants and insects, and we're all within the city limits. So everything we do has this um, this real world application. And so anyone who has a specific project on on plants or animals or habitats can contact me or our director Shelley Hunt and we help figure out the best spots for that research to happen, um, maybe the best time of the year. I have biodiversity like species lists of, of the insects, of the, of the birds, of the mammals, so that that can all be utilized for whatever project might, might want to happen. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. And we really encourage undergrad and uh, graduate projects here because obviously that's good for us too because the research comes out we can utilize that um, and it's just local so you don't you're not driving to a site a million miles away um, you can do stuff right here on campus this yeah. is part of campus yeah. the natural lab that your urban it, campus is exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's utilized it's not just science students that use this so we have um, we've had photography classes, we have art students that do things, I've had an eco-feminism course out here. Um, landscape architecture uses the site, so it's, it's, it's uh, you know, multi-dimensional about all the different courses that link to the art here. Yeah. So maybe one question about, because we um, have been talking about the campus master plan, I know the Arboretum has its own master right. plan, and yeah. in that context maybe uh, you could talk a little bit about the the history, the age, big picture, kind of the age okay. of the Arboretum, yep. the roles that it's played in the, okay. ca in the campus. So, so the Arboretum um, officially started in 1970. Um, sort of the brainchild from a bunch of different people who've always thought that it would be great to have an Arboretum, but it wasn't until 1970 where they went, okay, this is it. And our boundaries have sort of changed a little bit through the years, but um, so 165 hectares, and we have three main sort of mandates in our master plan that we need to try and cover. And that's uh, research is one of them, um, education is the other, and outreach is the third. So we, I look at the Arboretum as sort of a bridge between the general public or the Guelph community mm -hmm. and the university because um, we're able to do education here that that allows the general public to come to the site and realize that the university isn't something that's just over there and oh, you can't be part of that. We're trying to bridge all this research and the general public and do that for outreach, as well as you know, environmental education for children's groups, um, elder hostel groups, any type of age group that we've got. So that 
we can cover those three things of our of our mission statement. Yeah. So I yeah. like that. That's, that's a, good. That supports a good table. The three of those. Yeah. Things. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's really right. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, and then. Being where we are, the growth of the city and the growth of the campus, there's yeah. going to be all sorts of uh, edge effects, things coming in from right. the uh, development pressures. Yeah. Like, so you must get exposed to those all the time. Yeah. Well. So, so for example, right now we have we have a lot of issues happening because because we have so much space. Part of our problem is we have this space, which is great, but there's all this pressure from sort of the main campus oh well we want to put this here in your space and we're like yeah but if we keep losing the space the reason the Arboretum's here isn't going to work anymore so and yet we have to be careful because it's we're part of the university so we want to make that balance work but at the same time we need to try and we have to sort of even though we're a tiny staff we only have I think six and a half full-time staff to run the 165 hectares here um, we have to sort of, you know, get our back up and say, look, like, we need this for this to work. We can't keep getting smaller, um, especially because development is, is going all the way around the Arboretum. So um, the Turf Grass Institute and uh, agroforestry plots, those are all going to be developed. And that essentially is going to make this wild space within the city limits um, an island. And so we need to really focus on our wildlife corridors so that species can still move through the site yeah. um, so we're not completely cut off some from for example the river yeah. being connected to the river through a few little sort of areas is really really important um, so we need to think about all those different things when we when we consider um, development proposals or what's happening outside of the arboretum as well as what's happening inside the arboretum. yeah now when we were talking to um, to the physical resources about different development plans under that are happening and proposed under the auspices of the campus master plan. Right. Yeah. They talked about how the university will be involved in the development, some of the development plans. Some of them they'll do directly. Some of them they'll be right. involved yeah. in. And when they're not involved, when they're not the ones leading it, they'll be involved in coordinating like the the site survey that would be done that right. would have to be yeah. done. Mm -hmm. So, are, is there any of those that are happening on the edge that you can? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, and everything that happens, because we are still part of campus, any big developments we do here, we still go through physical resources sure. and all that type of thing. Um, right now, there's um, a site that isn't part of the Arboretum, but is right adjacent to our nature reserve. So we have a nature reserve on the other side of Stone Road, on the south side of Stone Road, that's 100 acres of beautiful swamp, um, mature forest. Um, three of our forests here have never been clear cut, so they're so they're old growth forests. Yeah. They have the same structure as they would even if we weren't here. Obviously, there's been some selective logging yeah. and introduced species that changed the makeup of those. Yeah, things that have germinated before golf. Exactly, yeah. that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, which is really Just, cool. That's totally cool. That, it's yeah. really neat. And so in the nature reserve, like we have some massive hemlocks. Um, there's this amazing swamp, which is a class one provincially significant wetland. Um, right beside that site, there is uh, an old field. It's a wet sort of meadow um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of property but it's not part of the Arboretum and so now we're having sort of an issue because the University wants to develop that um, and now it looks like they want to develop it into residential area um, with I think it's 16 homes and that's a big challenge for us because if it's right beside the nature reserve how do we stop someone's outdoor cat from coming in and taking out all of the, the ground nesting birds? How do we stop someone from planting periwinkle in their backyard and that growing into our nature reserve? Um, how do we even look at the genetics of our tree species, which is one of our major parts of research is our woody plant species. You know, if someone plants, um, a, I don't know, anything, a green ash, yeah. which is going to die anyway from emerald ash borer. But if they plant that and we're trying to breed one and then we get the pollen from this one that isn't even a local population, all of that stuff screws things up. And so it's a, it's a challenging thing, right? Because we're trying to balance supporting the university initiative, but at the same time protecting this nature reserve that's within the city limits and is a huge part of, of the wild space that wealth has. And so 
Um, we've already started putting plots out in case it is developed so that we can show the changes that happen. Um, but we've also contacted the city and said, if this happens, these are the things that we have to make sure happen at this site or it's going to be an ecological disaster. Which is, and that city is great about listening to all of our suggestions and stuff like that too. So, so it's it's interesting here because every you've been you've been exposed to the dairy bush that example that that develop, proposed development corner on the north side of the dairy bush. So all the same things the the the, uh, the entrenchment of the fragmentation, the degradation from the edge from different things yeah. that you were talking about that, yeah. that whoever backs onto there that's going to cause a leak of who knows how many tens of meters, but it'll be tens of meters at least into that bush. And then you've got something that in that case, that's only eight hectares, that is functionally smaller and functionally much more right. isolated. Oh yeah. And, and so that's all of that's happening yeah. in all of the different corners. Yeah. And and here it's, it's even though our site is bigger, it's almost worse because the effects on the biodiversity of the bigger site could, could end up ruining the fact that this is a big site, but if it's too isolated, we lose that effect of having a larger island yeah. if it's if the intense stuff around it is is ruining everything yeah. so yeah it's, it's a challenge no oh, i was gonna say great but huh yeah exactly <laughs> you're like woohoo go yeah. you oh, oh and then you're yeah it's bad.